Good afternoon and welcome to Automotive News Video. I'm Tiara Riddick. CES 2024 is just around the corner and it is one of the most anticipated events in the tech world. CES 2024 promises to be a showcase of cutting edge technology, innovation, and game changing ideas. From the latest in artificial intelligence to advancements in sustainable tech, this year's CES is expected to be a tech enthusiast paradise. Yesterday, we hosted a LinkedIn Live to talk all about it with our tech and innovation team lead, Pete Bigelow, staff reporter Hannah Lutz, and Kirsten Heinecke, leader for the Center for Future Mobility at McKenzie. To start, you know, we've heard of a lot of, a handful of automakers um, will be at CES, but the automaker presence is certainly dwindling. Kirsten, how do you think that could reshape the automotive piece of CES? Will more attention be on um, those startups that really uh, started the show or, or suppliers? What do you think? I think it's a great question. I think both, actually. So I think a lot of the innovation that we see in the automotive industry is anyhow being driven by the suppliers and now these days more and more so by the startup ecosystem. And I think this is a, uh, a chance for these players to shine even more and showcase all of their great innovations that will eventually anyhow make their way into the cars and then will eventually be part of an OEM's presentation. But I think we anyhow, like I was saying, see a, a large chunk of the innovation coming from this scene. And I think we'll just give them more room to be in the spotlight and present all the great tech that is going to come to our vehicles uh, quite short term. Kirsten, I'm curious, is, is the lack of an automaker presence this year, and like Hannah said, there certainly are some, but not the volume we've seen. Is Do you see this as perhaps a, a one-year blip, or, or is CES no longer the auto show uh, as, as it's kind of been over the past uh, five plus years? I hope not. I think uh, I think it's definitely a combination of maybe some budget restrictions on some parts of the OEM uh, of the OEMs, uh, and and maybe some of the OEMs have also been overdoing it a bit when it comes to how many people they were sending to CES and how much they made out of CES, right? But I I still think that CES is for the OEMs a very important show to showcase the latest tech in the vehicle, so a bit less sort of new cars, right? A bit more tech around infotainment, around autonomous driving, but also around other trends. Uh, and I think this will continue. So I would just take it as a, like you said, like as a blip, and I'm sure that they will be back in, in larger force, especially when sort of the situation improves a bit in 2025. What kind of autonomous vehicle technology do you expect to see at, at this year's show? There's been, um, you know, some nerves around that technology recently, uh, what we've seen with Cruz and some others. So what will the message be from these tech companies to reassure consumers and really um, explain the technology? So I think first and foremost, we're going to see, in my mind, all of the autonomous technology. So all of the different use cases, doesn't matter if it's private autonomy, level three on highways, uh, things that go into valet parking and other slightly more niche and, and um, specific use cases. But I'm sure we're also going to continue to see robo taxi technology, robo shuttles being presented. And then we're also going to keep talking about uh, freight transports or anything that is uh, level four trucking. And, and also other, other use cases around last mile delivery and so on. So again, I think all of it, and I'll probably miss two or three use cases from the drone space and from other areas. Um, I think the main message at CES this year is gonna be a bit similar to what we saw last year. So uh, the technology is getting there, right? It's just a question of getting it into the market. There are some kinks that we need to uh, figure out. And then especially for robo taxi and robo shuttle, I think it's also now very much about community engagement. So making sure that the stakeholders in the broader community in the cities where you're launching are aligned with the product and that they understand what is happening. And also about getting the economics right. And especially for robo taxis and robo shuttles, the challenge is in my mind, very much on how do I get the economics to a point where I can actually scale up the technology to multiple cities without burning countless amounts of money. And I think that's to me part of the of the message. Uh, it's It's a question how to get the technology out there, how to make it scalable. And to me, this is the main focus of, of the companies. What trendy vehicle features will we see being adapted as, as standard equipment for the 2024 model year? And I'll extend it maybe for 2025 as well. Um, any LIDAR or other connected vehicle features that will become sort of the norm? So I think um, LIDAR 
maybe not yet. I think that might take a bit longer, simply also with a with a sort of rollout of autonomous driving and with a penetration of autonomous driving systems on connected vehicle features and, and in-car software. I think that's where the innovation is coming from. So in my mind, the innovation is going to be very much driven around software. Uh, if you look at what the what the OEMs in uh, in Asia are doing specifically, you will also see that AI in the vehicle or like an assistant or a virtual concierge service or something like that is is also becoming more relevant. I think in-car gaming is something that's um, uh, that's that's quite interesting and that uh, customers are also wanting willing to pay for quite a bit. So I think all of these innovations around one cool services, cool features, if you will, in the car, but then also um, all of the services that really revolve around the vehicle. So anything that's related to making your charging experience, your fueling experience, your parking experience, maybe even your washing experience better. I think these are features that are that we will see coming to the car in the next couple of years. And the good news is they don't need to be installed sort of when you buy the vehicle, but you can actually just uh, purchase them as a subscription. And therefore, we can also update vehicles that are already on the road. Kirsten, maybe I have a, you know, the flip side of that question is what, what are consumers willing to pay for in terms of those uh, connected car features and, and how do automakers make money from them? And I think we've seen a few examples uh, early on here where, where there's been some backlash. So where, where does the rubber meet the road on that? So I think the good news is consumers are willing to pay for all of these features. We recently did a, a broad survey surveying consumers about, I think, 50 or even 70 different features and asking their willingness to pay. And there is willingness to pay for all of it. The not so good news is the willingness to pay is, depending on the feature, somewhere between 90 and 60 percent of what the OEMs are asking at the moment. So it's it's also a question that maybe some of the features that, that are in the vehicles are, quote unquote, overpriced. Um, and I think the other piece is then, is this a market where consumers would like to buy this as a subscription afterwards, or is it a market where consumers would actually like to buy it as a package once they once they uh, pay the vehicle and then actually factor it into the vehicle price? And I think there, there is no right or wrong. I think both options need to be available because some consumers say, hey, if I'm buying a car for $50,000, 50,000 euros, I'm, I'm very happy to spend another 500 euros dollars and then I simply have the connectivity features for the entire time. Others follow rather the Spotify, Netflix, and so on subscription logic and say, okay, I'd rather pay $9.99 a month or so for it, and then I'll get it uh, and, and be able to sort of ditch it if I don't want it anymore. So I think OEMs simply need to be able to offer both different, both of these options um, because the consumers will always want to have that flexibility and there are some sort of X factory and some uh, subscription based consumers. What types of um, features are they most interested in? Are they really focused on safety, on um, infotainment? What are kind of the top sellers or top interest categories? So we, we have, and that's again something we found out in our survey, we have two buckets, if you will. One big bucket is stuff that a few consumers, so fewer consumers are willing to pay a fairly high price for. And that's anything that's revolving around gaming, it's um, video streaming, it's uh, customized high-end content when it comes to audio, but then also video in the car. This is basically one, one bracket that sees a fairly high willingness to pay, albeit from a, from a smaller group. And then everything else that you can imagine, it doesn't matter whether it's features around uh, safety, whether it's features around um, uh, entertainment, but maybe a bit less customized, a bit less high-end. All of these are in a, in a bracket where you will see 60, 70% of people having a willingness to pay for it. Again, slightly lower willingness to pay than what the OEMs might be asking at this moment, but nonetheless, a very strong willingness to pay by the, uh, by the customers. So one a big topic area we have not yet hit on are electric vehicles. Um, so as we think about CES in, in a few weeks, um, how will the show kind of address consumers' concerns or, or just questions about EV ownership? What do you expect the, the show to, to give them some clarity on or give the industry really clarity on? So I'm assuming uh, whatever vehicles the OEMs are going to be showing, going to be having on, on stage, or there are going to be electric vehicles among them, right? And, and, and I do think that there will be, uh, especially around charging, especially around battery technologies, also some of the suppliers and some of the startups uh, bringing innovative tech uh, to the show. So there will be something around it. I'd say in, in my experience, uh, when we think about this framework of the 
case trends or ACES trends, autonomous connected electric chair. I think CS has historically always been a bit less on the E and the electrification part and more strongly on the software, on autonomous, on connectivity uh, and, and so on. So I think, yes, there is definitely there is definitely some electrification there, but I think it's not going to be the main focus of the show, at least sort of as far as I've seen. Kirsten, maybe bigger picture, uh, there are a lot of questions in the industry today as we speak about uh, consumer adoption of EVs. And I'm curious if if you see a the reputed slowdown right now, and, and if so, is it because uh, the industry is essentially uh, moving from early adopters to mass market? Yeah, I think that's that's a hundred percent fair, right? So we are moving from early adopters and also the early majority then towards the um, a later majority and the later on and the later adopters. Um, I also think that uh, some some question marks sort of around range and and the whole topic of range anxiety is still definitely there. I think with the recent increase in number of vehicles on the road, also the charging infrastructure is sort of challenged to a certain extent. Uh, and I think the, the the main the main reason or the main the main question is simply how quickly are we going to be able to take these question marks around charging anxiety both from a question of range but also will I find a charging spot away, and then I'm I'm sure that adoption is going to continue again. But I'm 100% with you. I think I, I wouldn't call it sort of um, a step back or something yet, but I think we are seeing a deceleration of the electrification trends. And uh, I think we're also in the process of slightly sort of uh, readjusting our assumptions for EV uptake for the coming years. You mentioned uh, the charging infrastructure, which is something we follow very closely. What's your take on um, not only charging, but also the EV availability and pricing in the U.S.? Is that holding back mass market adoption? So we've we've looked at this uh, in quite some detail, right? And if you if you take a look at how prices evolve between a typical internal combustion, combustion engine car and a typical EV, you see simply that many many OEMs have priced the EVs a bit more uh, up there, right? So they're a bit more expensive than the comparable ICE car, and especially in times where um, sort of consumer spending, and I think we're seeing that especially in, in Europe is sort of a bit lower and consumer confidence is a bit lower, people are obviously reconsidering these choices, right? We've recently done a survey where we asked people, what is your sort of change trajectory towards EVs? Is it you're buying another new ICE car? Are you holding on to your car longer and so that you are basically then buying the EV later? Or are you rather buying another used ICE vehicle before making the jump to EVs? And there is actually, there's all of the above, right? So we do see customers being a bit more hesitant in the adoption. What we don't see is that there is a an increase in people that say, I'm never going to go electric whatsoever happens, right? I mean, there is definitely a group of people that say electric, never. Uh, but it's not that it's increased recently. So I think it's more of a hesitation and maybe delaying the purchase a bit, uh, buying another used uh, ice or holding onto the vehicle longer rather than a true a true impact on uh, on sort of the overall sentiment uh, towards electric vehicles. Stay with us as we go beyond the headlines and get insiders view of the groundbreaking tech that will be on display at CES 2024 in January. Thanks for watching. For breaking news, stick with autonews.com. Have a great day.